What makes the United States of America different from other countries around the world? Consider what we ask our leaders to pledge their loyalty to. Unlike other armies of the world who swear to defend a nation, a motherland, a fatherland, a people, a president, el presidente, a king, a queen, what we do in the United States is unique because we swear an oath to defend a piece of paper that has ideas and values and what we believe. Today's guest is retired U.S. Army General Mark Hurtling. You've seen him on CNN, you follow him on Twitter, but you may be surprised to learn that he has a doctorate in business and he's an expert in leadership development, not only in the military, but also in the field of healthcare. We're gonna talk about all of that and a lot more on this episode of Crummer Connections. Welcome to Crummer Connections podcast series. I'm your host, JB Adams. In this series, I'm talking with members of the Crummer community and inviting them to share their accomplishments, challenges, and best business advice. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Consistently ranked as the number one MBA in the state of Florida, the Crummer School offers a variety of educational programs to prepare you to become a global, responsible, and innovative business leader. The Crummer Graduate School of Business, experience excellence. This season of Crummer Connections is devoted to influencers in our community, and today's guest is doctor and retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling. He had a 38-year career in the United States Army as a tanker and cavalryman, commanding and serving with soldiers at every level from tank platoon to field army. He retired from service in 2012, finishing his army career as the commanding general of U.S. Army Europe and 7th Army, where he led over 60,000 soldiers and partnered with 51 nations. In 2019, he graduated from the Karma School with an executive doctorate in business, researching physician leadership in healthcare. As an influencer, he currently teaches leadership to MBA students at the Karma School and to healthcare providers at several organizations. He sits on several nonprofit boards, and President Biden has appointed him as one of 11 commissioners to the American Battle Monuments Commission. He regularly appears on CNN as a senior military analyst, and he also has several hundred thousand followers on Twitter. Dr. Hurtling, welcome to the show. JB, it is great to be with you. Thanks so much for asking me to be a part of this. You, your name has been on, on our list for a long time, so it is a great pleasure to have you. I don't you. like to be on anybody's list. So. <laughs> well, it was a good list. Okay. Your name is on a good list. So we're going to jump right into it because of the date on the calendar. Today is August 24th. This show will come out a little bit later, but coincidentally, today is Ukrainian Independence Day. It is. So with that in mind, as you reflect on this day, um, what does the war in Ukraine mean to all of us, especially now since... This continues and it goes on. Yeah, well, to me, it's personal uh, because uh, my last job in the Army as the commander of U.S. forces in Europe, uh, I had a lot of interaction with the Ukrainian Army, specifically with their chief of their their ground forces, a guy named uh, uh, Alexander Vorobyov, who was a, a three-star general. He was my counterpart in Ukraine. And that individual uh, and I... It, worked a lot of issues, uh, a lot of the challenges that the Ukrainian army had in terms of building a force to be a professional force. They were breaking away from their old Soviet model. He was trying to really train a force that was professional in nature. Uh, and what I mean by that, it wasn't, uh, he was aiming to not have a, a conscript force, in other words, draftees, mm -hmm. and he wanted to build a professional force. Uh, he understood the importance of leader development. He understood the importance of having both his soldiers and his generals uh, versed in the elements of combat and warfare and serving the state. And I spent a lot of time in, in Ukraine. So when the American public sees all of these names of all of these places on the on the news, and they watch what's happening to uh, the culture and the government and the military of Ukraine. Truthfully, JB, I've got a little bit more special interest in it because I've met all these people. I've served with all these people. And, and as part of our mission set in U.S. Army Europe, we help train these people for conducting the operations they're con conducting right now. So it's important to so me. You genuinely know people that are on the front lines and, and, and putting up the fight. When the conflict started back in February, you said right away that this would not be over within two weeks. 
right. and that the Ukrainians would not surrender. What led you to believe that at the time? <laughs> By the way, I got a lot of heat you from did. a lot of people on that, especially my, my employers at CNN, where I work as an analyst. They said, how could you say that? It's so overwhelming. Well, both from a military perspective, in terms of the plans and the operations the Russians were planning to conduct, I knew it was prone to failure. But also knowing the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian army, I realized that they had the will and the dedication that the Russian army did not. And uh, as Napoleon, the great General Napoleon once say, uh, morale is to the physical is three is to one. So you can have a whole lot of equipment, you can have many people, but if you have the will to fight, if you're fighting for the right things, if you have the support of both the government and your fellow citizens, you can do an awful lot. And we've seen that in Ukraine, haven't we, over the last couple of months? Yes, we have. And and just to let you know, your the previous guest, the guest that preceded you in this season was Natalia Warren. And she's from a Ukrainian-American family. Right. And uh, she said the Ukrainians are fighting for their lives and their freedom. So, of course, they're going to fight to the end. Uh, I'm going to refer to Natalia Warren one more time because she posed this very specific question and she sent me an email literally yesterday saying, I would like uh, General Hurtling to compare the leadership styles of Ukraine's President Zelensky and Russia's President Putin. How do you think these leadership styles impact military operations and success? It, it is night and day. Mm -hmm. uh, what you see in President Zelensky is a leader who understands his, attrib his attributes, his competencies, his ability to influence, and the context that he is under. Surprisingly, those are the four things that are taught in Crummer mm -hmm. as the key elements of leadership uh, and what we teach now in the, in the uh, MBA program. Uh, when you see an individual who is the leader of a nation, understanding what he has to do to uh, collaborate and cooperate with alliances, how he not only has to mix his time spent with upper echelons, his, mm -hmm. his supporters, with lower echelons. There was a picture of President Zelensky yesterday going through several hospitals in, in the uh, Kherson district or Kherson Oblast, where he was awarding medals to uh, Ukrainian soldiers for their wounds in combat. He is on the front lines. He is talking and communicating with his people every day. And, and Crummer also tells us in the business school that communication or a lack of communication is the number one reason for most companies failing. Mm -hmm. It's also the number one reasons for most governments failing. So you have a president who understands the dynamics of leadership, where he must be, what he must do, how he must communicate, and how he must reflect a vision for the future you see just the opposite from President Putin. He is a pariah right now on the world stage. He is telling lies to his people as part of his communications. He did not have a solid action plan for his, his military or his government. So it is literally night and day. And they went in, the Russians went in believing that they could get it done in two weeks. In three days. In three days. Yeah. Yeah. They had a, a, a view that, that their operations in Ukraine would mirror what the United States did in Desert Storm. Uh, multiple day operation as opposed yeah. to months in the making. And unfortunately, President Putin did not prepare his military and was not understanding the state of his military or his government to accomplish that mission. All right, I'm going to move to a, a separate topic, but this is also filed under what's going on in the world right now with General Mark Hurtling. <laughs> uh, you are well known for having experience both in the military and in healthcare. And I had a conversation recently with a colleague of mine, Jake Poor, about the current mental health crisis in America. Uh, and I think this actually goes beyond just healthcare and military. We're also seeing it just in public service in general. People are burned out, um, they're suffering from mental health issues depression and suicide. This uh, article was in the USO recently that states, uh, among active duty and retired military members, suicide is currently at an all-time high, and it's been increasing ever since 9-11. Uh, the suicide rates among physicians is not necessarily at an all-time high, but it is uh, statistically higher than the average population. And we're hearing more about just burnout in general among healthcare professionals. What do you see as parallels between these two populations from your experience? Yeah, the, the combination, if, if you look into, um, there's a professor by the name of Maslach who studied extensively the area of burnout. 
And what she talks about is how there are several factors that contribute to burnout. What we're seeing in both the military profession and the healthcare profession and many others, and I'll, I'll comment on that in just a second, but what we're seeing is just a combination of people being overworked, being stressed because they have repeated issues with the same kinds of problems, but there is also trauma. In the military, uh, I think we have, we have almost fo focused exclusively on the traumatic effects of being in combat. In healthcare, what we've seen is a huge spike in uh, post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorders, mm -hmm. two different things within physicians, nurses, because of COVID. They have seen in the last three years, many of their patients die. As importantly, they have seen many of their colleagues die. Mm -hmm. There is a blowback effect of, of several things. Why wasn't this prevented, number one? And number two, why is it them and not me? Mm -hmm. That's a common factor. Survivor combat, guilt. The survivor's guilt. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. We're seeing the same kind of things in the military that are now being seen in healthcare of survivor's guilt. A lot of doctors are saying, why did I survive this in the emergency room and the ICU and others did not? So post-traumatic stress is common in a lot of industries. I think I would surprise you if I ask you, what do you think the number one industry is for post-traumatic stress? I would guess that it is military. I mean, they're exposing their lives. It's railroad engineers. Uh. And the reason why is because if you're a train engineer on a track and you're heading down the track and a car is on the track or a little kid on a bicycle and you can't stop the mm -hmm. train, it's all your fault. Mm -hmm. uh, and until the last couple of years of both war and COVID, uh, railroad engineers were the number one survivors of post-traumatic stress disorder. So anytime you have a brain dysfunction that says, this is not normal, what I'm being asked to do is impossible, that will create PTSD. Yeah. So it, it, the, the, and we also have a society that tends to be more self-reflective today than it was 50 years ago. So the combination of those two things, along with the other factors of what Maslach calls her, her, uh, her burnout factors, I think are contributing to all this. It will create in the United States and perhaps in other countries of the world, a massive mental health problem in the coming decades. Yeah, so it's not over. It's going to continue. No, it's not. Hey, hey, one other thing, you know, when when I was putting together my doctoral thesis, mm -hmm. uh, I was working with a hospital in Chicago uh, looking at leadership in physicians. And the chief medical officer says, hey, you're going to study these leadership aspects because we have had three suicides of our doctors mm -hmm. at this particular healthcare organization. Could you also study burnout? What I found in my thesis after applying elements of leadership was the ability of doctors to withstand a burnout factor was directly related to their understanding of their role as leaders. Now, I, I, truthfully, my, my thesis advisor, Dr. Jens in the, uh, in the Cromer School, and I, between the two of us, couldn't figure out the relationship, but all we knew is from the beginning to the end of a leadership development period, the self-reported by doctors, feelings of burnout decreased because they learned more about how to be better leaders, which is fascinating. Which is a form of self-leadership. If they have confidence in themselves as leaders, they have confidence. Not just themselves, but the organization they work for, mm -hmm. an understanding of what their values are and how they contribute to the society. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, that could be a potential future study. It could, but not for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to pivot to one last topic, and this they all sort of lead up to this one. So you and I share a love of history. We do. And an interest in leadership. Uh, this was maybe a month or two ago, but you had a series of tweets about the oath to the U.S. Constitution, and that inspired a lot of retweets and comments. Uh, tell us what prompted you to post that and why that message was so important to you. Well, what prompted me to to talk about that was a discussion of the oath that every executive takes in our government. Uh, so watching 
presidents, senators, members of cabinets, the military, and any professional that's part of the executive branch take an oath that I can recite, by the way, mm -hmm. if you'd like me to. It's I, Mark Hurtling, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear the orders of the president and all the officers appointed over me, and that I will well and faithfully execute the duties upon the office of which I am committed. Now, the first part of that says I'm swearing an oath, unlike other armies of the world mm -hmm. who swear to defend a nation, a motherland, a fatherland, a people, a president, el presidente, a king, a queen. What we do in the United States is unique because we swear an oath to defend a piece of paper that has ideas and values and what we believe uh, and how we're going to act. And what I saw during that time period was there were a lot of, unfortunately, governmental officials who were violating that oath, who were not swearing to support that piece of paper. So I just kind of wrote a short series of tweets on that and said, we need to get back to the ideals and the values of our country as opposed to winning and losing. All right. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but I will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have been approached with this question before, I'm sure. Have you ever considered running for public office? Absolutely. And no. Okay. Just wanted to get that out of the way. Yeah. Well, and there's a reason for that. I, I'm a soldier. Yeah. I, I'm not a politician. You know, I, I defend the country. I don't set the vision for the country. Now, there are many soldiers, many military people who will shift to do that. I just don't think it's in my style to do that. All right. But would you feel comfortable sharing an opinion with me? Sure. You got to recite the oath. I'm going to recite the preamble and you and I will unpack that sure. because I think it needs to be um, acknowledged in the 21st century. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this constitution. Madison and the other founders who wrote the Constitution, I, I, I look at this as sort of a mission, vision, values of the organization. And that is something that everyone should sort of rally around and contribute to. Uh, are we losing sight of this in the 21st century? Yes, we are. Uh, what you just read, in my view, uh, th there, are, there are many documents many speeches, uh, many procedures that, that really describe our nation. Uh, Lincoln's inaugural, Kennedy's inaugural, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, uh, Roosevelt's Four Freedoms. I mean, we could go down the list of the, of the words that have really developed a vision for our nation. But that preamble to the Constitution that you just read it hits every piece of who we are. Madison realized we weren't a perfect nation then and that we will never be a perfect nation, but the aspiration is to try and form a more perfect union. Madison said, ascribe to the rule of law. That's critically important. Madison said, domestic tranquility, the peace between people. So you can have different ideas. God bless you for it. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start fighting over that and saying, my idea is right and your idea is wrong, that's where we have some problems. And boy, have we seen those problems in the last few years. Well, and I would say the First Amendment protects your right to say, my idea is right and your idea is wrong, but it doesn't protect the right to go after people right. and hunt them down. Right, exactly. So there's a lot of restless energy. That was my careful choice of words <laughs> in our country now. And I think many people are unclear and even disagreeing about what we as Americans stand for. So you have all your experience as a military leader wearing a uniform, representing and protecting the interests of our country. To you, General Hurley, what does it mean to be American? Well, if you go back to the 
preamble that you just read, what it means to be an American is ascribing to what we say are our national values, respect for all people, understanding that you have a voice, but your voice doesn't always win. Sometimes those voices contribute, even though you may not like it, to a better future. Um, understanding that all people are valuable and the more the merrier. I mean, that's today's terms, not Madison's terms for sure. But the more that contribute, the better it will be. Uh, we have had, unfortunately, in our nation, uh, a history of taking the most recent uh, uh, immigrants to our country and not giving them their due justification. You know, we could say today it's immigrants from Mexico or Afghan immigrants or whatever, but this is a history that we have. I mean, if you go back to the Civil War, um, at the time, the Irish mm -hmm. were the most condemned in our country. Irish need not apply. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that is a recurring theme. And of course, we've always had the institution of slavery until the Civil War. Um, so it is devaluing people. I'm going to go, JB, I'm going to go back to your question. What does it mean? I think you said, what does it what mean? What does it mean to be American? To be and American? I've got a follow-up for that as well. So. It means valuing other people, understanding that I'll use the buzzword diversity mm -hmm. contributes to a better society and understanding that we have to live by a common set of rules, the rule of law, because we're always looking to advance the society and the culture to the future. That, let's go back to Ukraine. That's what Ukraine has seen in the last 15 years. They have pulled away from their attachment to the Soviet Union and realized that they have to go back to who they are, who their culture is. And it's very different than Russia. Russia doesn't like that. What we have to do as Americans is go back to, who are we? Is it, is it these values and these ideologies or is it who wins and who loses? Yes. And we seem to be more focused on who wins and who loses than we do on what's for the common good today, as Madison said. Exactly. And so with all that in mind, what is worth fighting for and what's not? Each other and our future. And what's not worth fighting for? Uh, <laughs> I'll be careful. Uh, <laughs> political ideologies, parties, uh, individuals, mm -hmm. um, who do not represent who we are, those are what's not worth fighting for. And, and a destruction of norms, societal norms. Now, by the way, JB, I am not a social scientist. I'm just a simple soldier. So I'm just giving you my opinion on what I see as some things that are effect negatively affecting our society today and what we may need to do to get back to what right looks like. Your opinion is welcome. Well, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our next topic. Our topic is backstory, which gives us a chance to get to know you and understand your early influences. You were born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. You attended a well-known all-boys junior reserve officers training corps. I want to call that, is that J-ROTC? J-R-O-T-C, that's right. J-R-O-T-C Catholic High School, and then studied at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. What I would like to know is... When did you know that you were attracted to a military career and what influenced you and what were the signs that you were headed in that direction? Well, the, the well-known all boys Catholic military school is a, is kind of a, a, a shift because I grew up in a very, let's just say lower income family. Okay. Uh, and I had the opportunity to get a scholarship, a, what's called a work scholarship to the high school I went to, Christian Brothers College in St. Louis. It was a prep school. And while there, it became readily apparent to me that as my classmates who were a little bit more upper class uh, were deciding on their colleges that I would never be able to afford a college. I had a great guidance counselor who came to me and said, you have potential. So there's this place called West Point uh, in New York. It's the military academy. And I had heard of it, 
uh, knew a little bit about it, but he said, you know, you can go there for free and they'll even pay you money every month, like uh, half a second lieutenant's pay, which is at the time was about $250. And you'll get a four-year education, but you have to give them back five years after you graduate serving in the army. Mm -hmm. I said, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. And I was a high school athlete, became a college division one athlete in swimming and water polo. And I said, this sounds great. So what surprised me was when I left for West Point in the summer of 1971, I know I'm now <laughs> giving out my age, uh, I had never left the city of St. Louis. I had never been on an airplane at the age of 18 until the age of 18. And I had, well, I was surprised at going into the Big Apple mm -hmm. in 1971 and then going up to West Point in upstate New York. Um, I realized from the very first day that this was something different. West Point today is very hard to get into. In 1971, yeah, not so much. Huh. And the reason why is because we were in the midst of the Vietnam War. No one wanted to join the military. Mm -hmm. So getting an appointment and eventually being accepted in the West Point was a whole lot easier than it is today. I think they take in, I may be wrong in this, but they take several thousands of applicants for every single person that is admitted into the Corps of Cadets today. But back then, it was not bad. Uh, I got in and I wasn't the smartest tool in the box, uh, but from the very first day on, it was something different. I saw the swath of American society. I had a roommate whose parents were uh, immigrants from Cuba. His father had been a Cuban freedom fighter. I had another roommate, a guy named Brian Haig, whose dad was a colonel working on the National Security Council, who later became the Secretary of State. So these are the kind of guys, and at the time, just guys, that you were involved in uh, with. Uh, so West Point changed my life. Uh, doing the kinds of things we did there was fascinating. Uh, we were introduced to things that you, we never thought we could do from both an academic, a military, and an extracurricular leadership perspective, and I fell in love with it. I thought that I would graduate, spend five years in the Army, and then get out, and what I found after I graduated and spent five years in the Army was, this Army thing's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I'm getting to see the world. From a kid who had never left the city of St. Louis until he was 18 years old till today, by my last count, I have been to 119 different countries. I have had, I have shared meals with privates in the armies and kings and presidents of countries. And it's really opened the perspective of what the world's all about. And this was because a high school guidance counselor. Yep pulled you out of obscurity and said, you've got potential. Yeah. And said, try this. What do you think mm -hmm. about this? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it and, and that's a great point to make JB and I'm glad you made it. The, the effect that individuals have on your lives, be open to that Yeah, because anyone can really change the, the direction of your life. I'm going to leave that one. I'm sorry. Straight. I bored you with that. No, no, sorry. that was not at all boring. Uh, I do want to acknowledge your story surprises me in this way. It sounds like there was not a family connection from your parents, no. uncles, grandparents in the military. No. And the fact that you got to go to West Point, again, you hear all these stories about generations of this person's father and grandfather and so on went to West Point and uh, you did not have that. You know, all, all of that is true, by the way. Uh, I had a couple of roommates. We changed roommates uh, three times a year. There's a reason for that. I won't go into it. But you know, talking to Brian Haig, my roommate, whose father was Alexander Haig, he, he really didn't want to go to West Point, but his dad kind of persuaded him to go there. Uh, I had another roommate, same thing. I had a guy who was a, my, not a roommate, but a best friend who had a scholarship to Juilliard, but it, because his father was a graduate of West Point, he kind of pushed him to that. And I think he's very bitter today because he didn't pursue music and instead went into the military. So you have to be careful of that too. There's a lesson in there. Yeah. All right, we're going to talk about your career journey. You've had many different roles and responsibilities throughout your career and in your book, Growing Physician Leaders. Mm -hmm. You make a point of saying that leaders don't have the right to have a bad day. In other words, leaders maintain a public face. 
But I would have to assume that there were some times in your career where you were having a bad day <laughs> and you just didn't share it publicly. Right. Um, what was a significant challenge that you faced in your career and, and what did you learn from it that you can share? Uh, if I can comment on leaders don't have the right to have a bad day first. Sure. It, it was something uh, one of my bosses said to me one time, or not to me, but to a whole group of people uh, when we were going through a very tough time. And what he said was, your soldiers are watching you mm -hmm. because we were placed in a very bad position. He says, we don't have a right to have a bad day. He says, you can kick stones when you're by yourself. You can kick the dog or yell at your wife. But when you're in front of people, you have to, as a leader, you have to present a very positive attitude. Um, I have been asked in the past, what was my worst day in the military? And I can tell you exactly when it was, it was 20, the 21st of January, 2008. I was in combat and during a span of about eight hours, uh, we had eight of our soldiers killed in action at three different locations. And when you're commanding people and when you're responsible for them, each one of your soldiers deaths. Uh, take an unbelievable toll. But throughout the day, I was being told about more casualties that resulted in death. And I knew that because of my experiences, that in each one of those casualties, someone tomorrow was going to go to that soldier's door back in Germany or the United States and tell either their spouse or their mother or their children that they had lost a husband, a son, or a father. So it, it really gets to you. I went back to the headquarters. I was out in the field during, it was, we were conducting a major operation during the time I went back to the headquarters when I got the notification of the last death after I had arrived back to the headquarters in Crete, Iraq. And I just went into my office and put my head down and cried like a baby. Um, my chief of staff, a guy named Brian Watson came in and saw it, came in the door, saw me just bawling, closed the door and left. And, and what he did is he went to get the chaplain. And the chaplain came in a few minutes later and he said, hey, sir, how you doing? And I said, not so good, Chappy. I said, uh, and by the way, I'm a, as I mentioned before, I'm a Catholic. This chaplain was a Methodist. So we were very close, but of different face. And, uh, he, he gave me counsel and sustenance and reminded me that he was my, he was not only the chaplain for the division of 30,000 soldiers, but he was my chaplain too, and prayed with me and helped me get through that very difficult time. Uh, but I could not show my face for a couple of hours because I wasn't having a good day. So part of being a leader, part of being a commander in the military is theatrics. Uh, and you have to be careful of the face you show. You, certainly you have to be human and you have to show emotions, but at the same time, in situations where other people will react negatively to who you are as a leader, you have to be very careful. And, and I would, sort of interpret that as you need to acknowledge people's emotions. There's a lot of leadership influence that comes from just saying what people are thinking. I'm feeling that you gave words to my feelings, but if you actually show it with emotion, then you're running a risk. Right. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also very taken with the idea that that chaplain was giving you a very human connection in that moment that was needed. And I kind of go back to our previous topic. We need a lot more human connection. Yeah to get through this crisis. And the difference, again, I would say between whether you're winning or losing versus the values you uphold. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for that. We're gonna move on to your Crummer experience. My favorite time of my life. Really? No. <laughs> it, it was good, it was not my favorite. It was very good. Well, good, because we're gonna go there. You and I have something in common, not regarding whether or not it was our favorite point in time, but about the doctoral okay. thesis. Um, so you were retired from the Army for several years. You were involved in leadership development in the healthcare industry. And something called to you and made you think, I need to get an advanced degree. What brought all of this about? No, something didn't call to me. Dr. Craig McAllister called Oh, to Craig me. McAllister yeah. called. After the book came out, he invited me to come over to talk to the, to the MBA students about leadership. 
because yeah. he, he saw the book, he read it and he thought it was good. So I came over one day to talk to the MBA students. And after the class, he said, hey, you know, we've got a doctoral program here that I think you might be interested in. Well, I hadn't thought of going into a doctoral program. But at the time, it seemed like a good idea. So I said, hmm, that's interesting. I, I might look at that. So I applied to the program. Um, I, luckily, I also had financing for it because I had the GI Bill and thought, why not use the money from the GI Bill to, to get a doctorate? And plus, there's always something about leadership that you always try and learn and grow every day. So here I am, an old guy. I was 61, I think, when I started the program. That's not old yet. Well, it, yeah, it's when you realize you're older than your fellow students and you're also older than all the professors, you're old. But it was fascinating. Uh, and it was just a great experience. The, the, the Cromer doctorate uh, was applying to it and getting into the program was truthfully a little bit serendipity, but it turned out to be one of the better things I've ever done. All right. Well, there's a, uh, a short list of people, or it's getting longer, who have also graduated with the EDBA. And, and I'm going to say that now it's time to play Crummer Insider Free Association. Okay. This is the game where there are no right answers, no wrong answers, no winners, no losers, and there are no prizes. So, uh, General Hurtlich, I will read to you a series of prompts. And for each one, you say the first thing that comes to mind. I started my EDBA in the year... Oh, uh, uh, 2016. And I graduated in the year? 2019. My cohort name and number was? EDBA4. Our cohort was known for being? Ooh, we were a pretty eclectic group because we had some really, uh, we had different industries represented and some very interesting people. Okay, my favorite class was? I'm going to give a couple. Strategy by Dr. Marshall, uh, International Business by Dr. Correa, uh, all of the classes by Dr. Kim Jens, who became my uh, uh, personal thesis advisor and mm -hmm. who is terrific, and Corporate Social Responsibilities. So there were four. All right. Very good. From the whole experience, my greatest time management lesson was? <laughs> uh, don't take what happens the first year and apply it to the other two, because because the first year was <laughs> the first year was fun and relatively easy, and it got increasingly tougher in year two and three. Okay, with that in mind, let's just say hypothetically, you were speaking to somebody who might be in the dissertation wilderness. Hmm. So two topics: finding a dissertation topic and then proceeding through the dissertation. What advice would you give to a doctoral student? There, well, I would only give them the advice of be prepared for what might happen. Uh, Hemingway once told aspiring authors, and I, I learned this when I was writing my book, that a book follows the three M's. At first, it is your mistress, and you love it completely, and you want to spend a lot of time with it. Then, as you get through it, it becomes your master, and it, it really beats you up. And then the final phase is when it becomes a monster, when you think it's you're finished with it, but you still have to do more work and you just want to stop and end it. So be prepared for the three M's of thesis writing. Be passionate about what you're studying. I think we should even be passionate through the master and monster phases. Right, exactly. As much as we can. All right, what was the impact? What was the outcome of getting your executive doctorate? Well. Uh, I go, I always go back to, you know, Crummer has a great program where they not only assign you a faculty mentor, but they also assign you a student mentor from the class above you. So my student mentor was a woman by the name of Rhonda Bartlett. Uh, she had, she was also in healthcare. She wasn't quite as old as I, but she was close. She was in her early fifties. And during the cocktail reception we had on the very first weekend of classes, we were talking to each other. And I said, so Rhonda, I said, what'd you get out of this program? And she got this big grin on her face. And she said, I learned how much I didn't know. <laughs> she said, I thought I knew a lot. I had a, you know, she says, I was a nurse. I worked in healthcare. I'd gotten my master's degree, but I thought I knew it all. And when I got into the doctoral program, I realized how much I didn't know about the subject I was interested in. Yeah, it's humbling. It is. 
All right. So the dissertation that you wrote happened after you wrote this book, Growing Physician Leaders, but they connected, right? The, t the dissertation topic and the content in this book have some connections to mm -hmm. each other. Yeah. By the way, I, I love all the stories in particular, Good. the war stories. I'm glad. Uh, but the essence of this book, I would say, is that physicians are trained to be physicians. They're not necessarily trained to be leaders in a healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And so some of them are not ready and they're not equipped to genuinely perform as leaders. When you get it to work, what does it look like and how good can it get? Oh, it's magical. Um, and, and I'll restate what you just said, if you don't mind. Physicians are trained in the science of medicine. Uh, what's fascinating is they receive, writ large, very little training in the art of leadership. But physicians, because they are members of a profession, all professionals have to balance science and art. Um, but, but they don't get a whole lot of training in that. When you start just giving the basics of the art of leadership to physicians, they step into our healthcare system because they have the knowledge and expertise of what's going on at the patient level that mm -hmm. administrators sometimes don't have, uh, hospital administrators or corporate administrators or government officials who deal with healthcare policy. When doctors aspire to and achieve the courage that they need to make comments about the, with, with an informed view. It isn't just, hey, this is what I believe. Uh, this is what we should do. If you get an understanding of what leadership is, of using the Aristotelian approach of logos, pathos, and ethos, mm -hmm. using logic, passion, and reason uh, in terms of developing new approaches to dynamics, if you get the experts involved in that, it's magical. I mean, it's it's like, I, I would tell you, it's like a general. If I never went and talked to privates to figure out what was going on at the at the dirt level, I'd be a really crappy general. Um, doctors are the same because they can provide information to those who are managing and leading large healthcare systems in the United States right now, which truthfully are in bad shape across the board. And you've seen transformations happen. I have. Um, I will name the organization I was a part of, but I, I worked with Advent Health for five years. And part of the reason for, to, for bringing this leadership program together was the COO, a guy named Brian Paradis, wanted to change the culture where doctors were more involved. He wanted doctors to come to the table. Now, as, as neophytes, uh, civilians, you and I, we don't know what goes on in a hospital, but there are oftentimes the, the difference between the stovepipes of the administrators and the stovepipes of the doctors. And there's a lot of research, which I saw at Crummer, saying how much tension and lack of trust there is between the two. Well, if you can bring the two together in a team, uh, the results are just absolutely magical. And it's true in any profession. I mean, in the military, it's the same way. If you can bring civilian leaders and military generals and soldiers together to really determine how to solve problems, it makes a whole lot of difference. Yeah. All right. We have one more segment. So this one is called Best Career and Business Advice. Uh, you have several hundred thousand Twitter followers and people see you regularly on CNN. So what I'm curious about, and you may have shared this with others before, but I, I had to go looking and I didn't find it. When you retired, were you approached by somebody who said, hey, you, you'd be really good on television. We need you to comment. Or did you pursue this? No, I didn't pursue it. I actually was approached by someone. I had a, uh, a CNN reporter embedded with me in Iraq in 2007 and 8 by the name of Michael Holmes. Uh, he's on CNN International today. He has his own show. Uh, but he was with me for six months. And after I retired, I got a call from Michael and he says, hey, since I was with you, I was asked by CNN to see if you'd be interested in being a military analyst. And, and I was on the phone with him. I said, for CNN? And he says, yeah. And I said, oh, hell no. I said, not only no, but hell no, I'm not going to do that. And he goes, and he laughed and he says, why not? I said, 
I couldn't stand you guys when I was with you in the military. Why would I be working with you now? Kiddingly. And he goes, he laughed and he says, well, if you ever reconsider, let me know. So a couple of months after that, I, you know, I was vanity kicks in and it's like, oh, they want me to be a CNN military analyst. So a couple of weeks after that, we were in, my wife and I were in Washington, D.C. because our son was graduating from getting his master's from Johns Hopkins. And we happened to be staying with uh, our best friends who happened to be General Marty Dempsey, who is my best friend. We were, we lived in a duplex together when we were captains. So Marty was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time. So he was President Obama's senior military advisor as a four-star general. So we were having a beer and a barbecue in his backyard. And I said, hey, Marty, by the way, I said, CNN asked me to be a military analyst. Isn't that a hoot? And he stopped. And Marty's a really personable guy. He's fun-loving. He stopped cold. And he looked at me and goes, so, so you're going to do it, right? I said, hell no. And he says, why not? I said, well, I, I don't want to do that. I said, that's, that's, you know, and he goes, no. He says, Mark, I need you to tell him yes. I said, why? And he says, well, he says, I'm really tired of the strategic corporals and the SEAL Team 6 guys who are on TV telling the nation what our national strategy should be. He says, we need someone talking about it from the standpoint of a person who's done it as opposed to someone who's guessing about it. So I had a little bit more discussion with my wife. She was not in favor of me doing it because she was afraid of the blowback from people. Um, but I finally called CNN and said, okay, I'll do it, I'll, I'll try. And during that time, this was in 2014, a lot of things were happening. Uh, MH17 shoot down. Uh, another war in Israel, mm -hmm. and Israel was part of my area of operations when I was in Europe. So I knew a lot of the stuff about things that were happening at the higher level, at the strategic level. So was there blowback? Have you seen blowback? Oh, God, yeah. yeah? Uh, especially during, well, I'll just say during the last administration. Oh, yes. And part of the reason for that is I was giving military input, but it was seen as a partisan attack. I'll give an example. Uh, you, you may not know this, but here's something for your listeners. I was the very first general that President Trump said he was smarter than. Nobody knows that. But this all came about in an interview with Anderson Cooper because Trump had made a statement about going into Iraq, stealing their oil, being able to, to get uh, oil companies in to take their, that's called looting and plundering, mm -hmm. and it's a war crime. So I was on with Anderson Cooper, and, and I said, hey, look, when I was in northern Iraq where the oil fields are, uh, we tried that. We tried to get Exxon and Mobil to come in and take a look at how they could help the Iraqis get their oil industry back up. I said none of them wanted to stay because it was such a, you know, a, 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 a traumatic period during the rush, right? So they don't want to stay there to invest in Iraqi oil. And we certainly don't want to steal that oil. So that's what I said. The next night, Cooper gets um, candidate Trump uh, in, in Trump Towers. And he says, we've got a general, General Hurtling, who says, you can't steal Iraqi oil because it's a war crime. He tried to pull oil companies in. And Candidate Trump said, well, then I'm smarter than General Hurtling and he's an idiot like all the other generals. And, and he kind of went off. There's a YouTube video somewhere online on that. And so I, I, when I saw it, I, Cooper had asked me on the show. So I'm waiting in the, in the ready to go on. And he's showing this film of Candidate Trump saying all this. So when he came to me, he goes, OK. <laughs> in fact, what he said was, General Hurtling, I hate to put you in this position where you're commenting on this. And I was thinking to myself, no, you don't. You love this. <laughs> so I kind of said what I thought. Well, from then on, it was, you're a partisan. I'm a partisan. Mm -hmm. I'm an Obama general. I'm, you know, and what I was just pointing out, going back to your first question about the Constitution is, what do our leaders do? What does right look like? How do you abide by the rule of law and secure the country? That's what I was commenting on as a military analyst, not about politics. It's tough to do. So yeah, it's it's not all sunshines and unicorns. So that's 
that's the risk you take by becoming a public figure. Mm -hmm. Th that's kind of the burden that you bear. Right. Uh, for speaking out for the right. Exactly. All right. Uh, General Mark Hartling, we're about to wrap up our time together. Mm -hmm. And as we do, I would just like to ask, is there any message that you would like to send out to the Crummer community today? Yeah, I, I had, truthfully, I had never heard of Rollins College or Crummer before I came to Orlando. Uh, and it is a true gem, not only in this community, but in the nation. And I've been watching it very closely, uh, amazed that we're the top school in Florida for, for business at Crummer. We're the, one of the top six in the country. And what I saw recently, a, a rating of one of the top 13 in the world, which is absolutely amazing. But um, what I just, as an advertisement for my experience at Crummer, uh, you know, I, I got my undergrad at West Point, a pretty good school. I got a master's at Indiana University, a pretty good school. Mm -hmm. Another master's at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., a very good school. Crummer compares favorably with all of them. It, it is on par with every single one of those national institutions. Uh, the people you meet here, the professors that are here, the staff and faculty are all phenomenal. So that's what I'll say. General Mark Hurtling, thank you for joining us on Crummer Connections and sharing your story. It's a pleasure. Thank you, JB. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Now is a great time to consider enhancing your career success by pursuing an advanced degree in business. And the Crummer School offers a variety of educational programs to help you become a global, innovative, responsible business leader. To learn more about the programs and begin the application process, go to crummer.rollins.edu. The Crummer Graduate School of Business, experience excellence. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon with another episode. Crummer Connections podcast series is a production of Victor Media Group. If you like this show, follow us on your favorite social media platform. Today's show was created and hosted by J.B. Adams and executive produced by Gerard Mitchell. Recording took place at the studios of WPRK with technical and production design by Angel Cologne, technical and production assistance from How Do, Jessica Gilkey, and Jayanne Gilkey, and final video and audio editing by Nanny Simone. Our gratitude goes out to Mike Brown and Loveland Finley in Alumni Relations for their gracious help and support. Until next time, Fiat Lux.